Hey, Chris Brown, Steve Tasker, and you know who else accompanies us at that time. It is senior producer from NFL Films, co-host of the ESPN NFL Matchup Show, Greg Cosell, whose weekly segment is presented by Scott Lawnyard, an official commercial site work partner of the Buffalo Bills. Greg, it's like bowl season here in week 17. This is the granddaddy of them all here on on the weekend of week 16. Nothing comes close to this one. It's the only game with two teams with a winning record. Well, it, it's a pretty big game. I'm actually really looking forward to this game. I hope it lives up to the billing, Brownie, because it's uh, it's one I've been really looking forward to. Yeah, these two teams, it's, the, it's tied for the most combined wins in a matchup of any Monday night football in NFL history with a San Francisco-Denver game back in 97. So, wow, lots of wins in this one. This is a great one. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? How, give us a little synopsis of how these two, two, two teams mesh and what are some of the key questions that you have when you look at the X's and O's? Boy, there's, there's a lot to unpack there, Steve. Um, I guess let's, let's start with uh, the Bengals' offense. Um, I think a number of things stand out when you look at their offense. Number one is Burrow is a really aggressive thrower outside the numbers. So when you when he feels there's one on ones with Chase or Higgins outside the numbers and the safeties would not be a factor in the throw, he's going to throw the ball. And it doesn't always have to be a vertical route. It could be out routes, but he attacks outside the numbers. And now you're going to get into a situation where White, Tredavious White, and uh, I guess Jackson and Elam, if they continue uh, playing an equal, relatively equal number of snaps they'll have a pretty serious burden in this game. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting they'll lose those matchups, but you have to be prepared that he's going to work outside the numbers if you get one-on-one -on -one matchups. That really stands out about Burrow. Um, the other thing that really stands out about Burrow is just the efficiency with which he plays. Um, he's really good on third down. He's, a, he's really, uh, and this speaks in some ways, which we can talk more about to the contrast, it, between the two quarterbacks. Burrow is a kind of an, a subtle, nuanced, detailed player. Everything about the way he plays looks, I don't want to say easy because it's never easy, but he never looks under duress. He never looks as if anything's happening too fast. It, it, he just looks as if he's always in control and in command and he knows where to go with the football. Um, now, I'm very curious to see uh, the, the right tackle situation. He has learned over the course of this year and, and probably through last year as well, sort of how to navigate through playing behind a not great offensive line. I think he had to learn that at the NFL level, and he's done that. Uh, and his movement within the pocket is really high level. He has an innate feel to, for doing that. So, you know, you're dealing with a really good passing game and a quarterback who's really got high level traits, the, the, the nuanced quarterback traits. Yeah, I would argue, Greg, that his game this year, you know, yards per attempt for him is down, yards per completion for him is down. Maybe that's slightly a byproduct of the absence of Chase from the lineup for about a month with the hip injury, but I'm of the belief that he is more willing to take the checkdowns and the layups yeah. this year. His game almost resembles, it's Brady-esque almost in a way this year, yeah. it seems. Yeah, and, and I think that's also just a, uh, a a development in his game, a positive development in his game, because he is an aggressive thrower. That's why I mentioned outside the numbers. Those throws are, are not really risky throws because you're not throwing into the into the heat of coverage, um, you know, the cauldron of fire, as it were. Um, but, yes, I think that he's developed more in, an understanding of what what you can take when you can take it when you can be aggressive when you don't have to be aggressive um and i think that just comes with experience um and you know he's, he's a really strong processor he sees things before the snap he knows where to go with the ball now he is aggressive at times and once in a while we'll throw some picks um and you know ideally you'd like to be in a situation where you can maybe create that but for the most part, he's just a really highly efficient ball distributor and executor of a pass game. And then you've got the three wideouts. Can he, is there a, a huge differentiation between the T. Higgins, really good player, Tyler Boyd, really, really good, good player, and then, of course, Jamar Chase. And then 
Then you watch the New England game, and you got this guy, Trenton Irwin, who shows up out yeah. of nowhere, you know, right? So uh, they have got – I mean, they've got guys out there, right, Greg? And that's what um, they are. The yeah. they're an elite group. Yeah, they've got three guys that would be considered, you know, in the top group at their position. You know, Chase is certainly special when healthy. Higgins, to me, I, I remember watching him coming out of Clemson, and I, I thought much more of him than others did. I guess he was a second round pick, and a lot of people dinged him for running, I guess, a four five seven or a four five eight. But he's 6'3", 216. And one thing I learned years ago, Stephen, and, and you can appreciate this being a wide receiver and, and you know understanding the position is stride length is a trait. So when a guy is 6'3", 216, just because he's a 4'5", as opposed to a 4'4", those guys eat up ground in a hurry. And I learned that years ago when I started really evaluating receivers and didn't understand that and would ding receivers and then be wrong once they got to the NFL, you know. But he's a guy that, you know, if he has free access off the line of scrimmage, he eats up a lot of ground fast um, and he can get on top of you. And Burrow has no problem, as we're seeing here, giving him an opportunity to make contested catches because he's very good at the catch point at the moment of truth. So they have two really good wideouts. And then you're dealing with Boyd, who is a really, really good slot receiver. He can work inside extremely well. Um and, you know, sometimes based because the, the Bills are a, a a nickel defense, rarely play dime. They played a few snaps this week, but they're not really a dime defense. By formation, you can sometimes get Boyd versus nickel where he runs those inside routes against a linebacker. And they will they feel very, very good about that, obviously. All right. So you mentioned how aggressive Burrow is outside the numbers, you know, when they get man coverage. Why would any defense play much of single high safety at all against this passing game? Wouldn't you just cover two well, this thing yeah. up most of the day? Or well, it's not. It's not Brownie always. It doesn't have to be single high. I mean, if yeah. you're a quarters team, you know. Again, now you're getting into what coverage they want to play. Theoretically, cover two. Theoretically, cover two would take care of some of that. Although you do get the outside void in cover two, right. and Burrow will throw that the little turkey shot. You know, but. If you want to play quarters, you know, if you line up in a two by two set as an offense versus quarters, you know, if you run number two vertically, that safety has to match him. So it still becomes, in a sense, one on one on the outside. So you can create that through formation and use of your personnel on the route concepts. You can create one on one on the outside, even versus zone coverage. Um, so and, and now we're getting you know, the bottom line point is you're getting to situational football. You know, right. ideally you would like to be in situations where it's third and eight. You know, you want that against anybody, but you really want it more against these kinds of teams because when they are when they can be proactive with their use of formations and route concepts, they're a difficult offense to defend. What who, what defenses have had the most success against them? Um, and, and how does that happen? I, I sense... Their offensive line isn't as dominant as you'd like to have it. No, it's not. Uh, and maybe it's that's not. the maybe that's the key to this whole thing is putting okay. Joe under duress. You, you need to put him under duress, and even though he doesn't look like he's playing fast when he's under duress, obviously he does speed up when he's under duress. That's just natural for a quarterback because no quarterback uh, really likes to get hit. Although I remember your old guy telling me when I interviewed him. Uh, years, a hundred years ago, Jim Kelly saying, I don't feel good about a game until I get hit. And I'm thinking to myself, you're nuts. But yeah. uh, anyway, most quarterbacks do not like to get hit. And, uh, um, and, and, you know, certainly Burrow is that guy. But so you really want to be able to generate some pressure, make him speed up a little bit. Um, like I said, he will turn it loose. So he's had some games this year. Uh, I know he had four interceptions week one against the uh, the Steelers. That seems like a very, very long time ago. He's not thrown a lot of interceptions since then, but he is aggressive, and that can happen. Let's flip it around. What do the Bengals defend? I mean, they're good at disguise. We know that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anna Rumo likes to, you know, spin the dial on quarterbacks, give a much different look post-snap than pre-snap. Um, Absolutely. Who are... I know Von Bell's gonna been a prime player for them for a while, but who who are the the main actors in that disguise category? Yeah, uh, just one quick point before I answer that is he's a good adjuster too, Lou Anaramo. You'll see him make changes throughout the game. Uh, you know, very often 
you, you watch teams come out at halftime and you really have no idea because the adjustments are so subtle and nuanced and you don't really know. With him, you can really see that he makes adjustments at halftime. Uh, so that's another thing to be aware of. He's a very good in-game adjuster. Um, it, it, it appears as if Hubbard might be back this week. So, you know, certainly Hedrickson is, is a good pass rusher. Um, he's someone you do have to be concerned about in, in, in those down and distant situations where it's pass rush. Um, you know, Hubbard is a really good athlete. They use him on stunts a lot as the looper. He's really flexible and bendy. Um, you know, and the run game reader is really a, a man inside. And we'll see how the Bills choose to play this week coming off a game in which Singletary and, and Cook combined 23 for 205. And I think they need to continue to try to have the run game be a somewhat meaningful part of their offense. Um, and then in the secondary, they're not a high percentage man team, but they do play man on third down. Now, the question is, would they continue to do that this week with Josh? Um, because on third down, they're a dime team and they bring in Trey Flowers, a big corner, and he is their dime. And they like to play man and match him up to tight ends. Um, and that's kind of their M.O. So the question is. What's the Josh Allen factor in this game? Will they continue to do that, Brownie? Or is this a game because of Josh that you don't see that as much? Yeah, yeah that's that's the big question. And, and that's what this is always going to come down to. Both teams have tremendous players, great depth. And it's you got to watch this matchup. I mean, uh, oh. last one from me, Greg, before we go. The Bills have shown the ability to win games in different ways this year. They ran Correct. it. They've, they've, they've done the long ball, the short ball, the big play, grind it out. Um and are the or what if there is something that the Bills could win this game with that my that Cincinnati is not that great at that they could exploit? What would it be? Well, to me, and it's not a matter of Cincinnati not being great at. I don't think they're great on defense at one thing. I think they're really solid. I, and, and they've been doing more with him in recent weeks. I think Dawson Knox could be a factor in this game. Um, you know, they've been using him a little more. Now, a lot of that's been against zone, and that's fine. That's what Cincinnati plays on early downs. You know, they've been using him with flood concepts where he's the intermediate route runner, getting to it in different ways, whether he's on the slide, side of the flood concept, whether he's coming from the other side, flood opposite, as I call it. You know, I think he could be a guy to look for in this game. I think there'd be opportunities for Dawson Knox in this game. Greg, as always, we appreciate the insight. Thanks for joining us as always. I'm assuming this is going to be a big part of your uh, uh, yeah, NFL it was a, matchup it was a full show. Segment. Yeah, it was a full segment game, Brownie. You assumed right. It's the yeah. best game on the schedule, obviously. Yeah. Kind of a no-brainer. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks yeah. as always, Thanks, Greg. Greg. Have a happy new year.